Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Junkies, where this Sunday is going to be another very interesting night and a very interesting podcast. Um, if you're just tuning in this week to check out this podcast, uh, look back at last week's podcast. We had Pal Chang on with Esoteric Knowledge. Um, he's written a book as well, uh, Word Magic, a great book. We had Pal on last week. It was a, a great podcast. Pal, thanks for joining Talk Junkies. But this week, man, <clears throat> it's going to be a very, very interesting. And the reason I say that is because, one, inflation's happening everywhere, um, especially in the grocery stores. And I don't know how much we're going to get into that tonight, but uh, the guest we're having on tonight, Benjamin Lohr, has written a book, The Secret Life of Groceries. Benjamin, how you doing? Thanks for joining Talk, uh, Talk Junkies, man. Yo, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, man, how you've gotten to where you are today. <laughs> well, I don't know. Where do you begin? Uh, yeah, I am a writer. Wasn't always a writer. I kind of uh, graduated thinking was going into the sciences, ended up teaching high school for a while because I thought that that would give me time and space to uh, to write in the afternoons you know I was like teaching you get off at 3 30 you don't have to do much you get summers off this perfect career to like kind of allow somebody to to have to write uh, and that was of course not true at all <laughs> in fact, uh, teaching was incredibly demanding incredibly rewarding. I loved it, but I didn't get a, a lick of, of writing done in the seven years I was a high school teacher. And then I kind of continued working with schools after that. And I'd say about a, a decade in this New York school system, I just was like, you know, if you're ever going to write, you need to create some separation in space. And that's when I started working on my first book, which, uh, is somewhat similar to the groceries book. I think it like I, I'm a pretty immersive journalist. I try to get as close to the sources that I'm writing about as possible. Want partly selfish just to like put some first person um, present tense descriptors in the text so it feels immediate, but also just you know try to understand life as it comes to the people I'm trying to write about. So and try to understand it on their terms. So that book involved um, really trying to understand why a yoga community, uh, the Bikram yoga community was as passionate about Bikram yoga as pos as they were. And it snowballed into like a bigger story uh, around narcissism and um, this, you know, kind of megalomaniacal guru who is at the heart of Bikram yoga named Bikram Chowdhury. Uh, and kind of created community dynamics in that community that drew people in and, and really allowed them to, to both give themselves over to the yoga in, in both positive ways and um, really negative ways. Um, and then, yeah, once I, once I wrote that book, uh, you know, the writing, the writing became a bigger part of my life. And uh I was hunting around for a different topic. Uh, while I was writing the Bikram book, I remember very vividly, you know, I, again, I'm immersive kind of journalist. So I'm doing tons of fucking yoga when I'm, when I'm writing this book. Uh, I was practicing yoga six days a week, two hours a day. Um, and, and to get close to this guru, Bikram Chowdhury, I went to his teacher training and, and a number of other teacher trainings. And at one of those teacher trainings, we're like marooned at this hotel um, in San Diego, kind of locked in doing yoga for nine weeks straight. And they let us out to go to a grocery store. And all of a sudden, I, like all of us trainees, yoga trainees, went to a Trader Joe's and I don't think I'd ever been to a Trader Joe's before, which is maybe weird, but I just watched these other grown adults lose their minds. Like they were so excited about Trader Joe's. It was like uh, an amusement park and they were just kind of giddy little kids for a second telling me about all the delicious things they were going to buy there. And it just was like a tr head trip, you know, it was like, oh, these people are so excited about a grocery store, which when I was growing up was like a chore that you didn't really want to go to. And it, it clicked in my head and it was very similar to the passion that they had been bringing to the yoga. And so I, you know, I, I just thought, I, there was something there in the same way that I was trying to understand how yoga was shifting and what was attracting people 
to this practice, I was like, what's attracting people to this larger transformation around food that where it went from, again, when I was growing up, like food was something you ate, there weren't that many options. And I grew up in a fairly cosmopolitan, you know, I grew up in the DC area. Um, my parents went to a food co-op, like I, they were foodies of their time, but there just wasn't, you know, I remember the time my dad brought a box of mangoes home and it was like big, you know, it, that was a big deal. Uh, and then that's just seems like quaint in that now there's like mango chewing flavored chewing gum there's dehydrated mango there's raw mango and there's like you know seeing a mango in the produce aisles is like shrug your shoulders it's like a cliched fruit uh and so trying to understand both why people were attracted to the grocery store in that kind of way and how it became an identity signifier our larger switch around you know how we were viewing food as a culture um, really opened the door to this book, which then became a wide look at just like what the grocery store is and what it symbolizes. I was going to say, I, I read a little bit, not of the book, but I read a little bit of an, there was either an article that was reviewing the book or I saw, I can't remember because it's been like a month now and I have a bad memory, but it was either reading an article that was reviewing the book or watching one of the podcasts that you were in before. And it was talking about just you go really in depth and behind the scenes kind of, of how these grocery stores work and how there's this or not how grocery stores work, but how our entire like food economy works for lack of a better term, of yeah. just how everything gets to where it is. And it's pretty crazy actually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's my thing. I mean, I want to get as close. So for this book, you know, first I was drawn in by Trader Joe's I tracked down, the Trader Joe, Joe Kalum, who founded the chain in the 1950s, interviewed him and, and a bunch of other people who are high up in the Trader Joe's organization uh, at that time and, and present day to try to look at like how the grocery store was working out from kind of like an executive leadership level. Uh, and then basically descended down in the chain to like people that we, you know, what's it mean to be a grocery buyer. Uh, what's it mean to be a food entrepreneur who's trying to bring her products to market? And so follow the buyers around, followed entrepreneurs around as they're like developing their product and trying to get it into stores. Then what's the system of logistics, right? The grocery store is this miraculous thing that is premised on enormous abundance of food in continuous supply. That's really what makes the grocery store the grocery store and, and in some ways it to me it became like a big stand-in for like american privilege and i'm not like crazy about the word privilege it's like kind of has a lot of meaning attached to it now but there's something about the grocery store that's like you can walk down the street or get in your car and drive to a place that has more options than the greatest kings and the greatest pharaohs and the greatest emperors had in their entire lifetime and you can get it just by pushing your cart in, dumping some objects in there and, and checking out. Um, and so that, that abundance really led me to the supply chain and the people who are responsible for the logistics around it. And so then following them around, I drove, you know, cross country with a trucker um, to, you know, cause at the heart, they're really the, the people who, um, you know, underpin the system of logistics in, in, in the US. Uh, and then, you know, went down the chain from there and, and looked at people who are responsible for raw material extraction, farming. Uh, and in, in the case of the book, like I really spent a lot of time with uh, fish farmers in Thailand, be, people at the way bottom of the commodity chain, who, again, because of the a sheer amount of abundance that the grocery store is bringing us and the volumes are you know, I haven't done a great job of setting the stage here, but, you know, we're talking stores, average stores with like 45,000 different individual items, big stores like a Sam's Club or, a, a, you know, Walmart Superstore is going to have 125,000 different individual items. That volume that it takes to, to, to fill those stores creates a supply chain that is, you just can't see through it. It's just so much stuff is going through and sourcing that stuff involves so many different people that uh, the idea of tracing a good sounds 
easy on paper, but in reality, it gets kind of drowned out by the volume around it. So can't you bring it back to the beginning, though? Like through your research, what what was the first purpose of maybe one of the first grocery stores to ever open? Um, what was yeah. the, the main goal for grocery stores opening up in the United States or even worldwide? What was their their first goal with that? Probably to get food. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a good question. So, so back in the day, say like 1850s, 1860s, there was something called the general store, which was like a grocery about the size of like half the size of a convenience store of today. It sold dried fruit, you know, boots, <laughs> clothing, uh, not much fresh produce. You know, you could get meat at a separate place, a butcher. Um, and the grocery store kind of evolved from that largely due to two different factors. One, so to get to, to answer your question, like why um, people wanted things cheaper <laughs> and they wanted more of it, but how you got to that, like why people wanted more things cheaper is actually like an interesting question. Uh, what happened was there was this revolution in packaging in right around the civil war, Napoleonic wars, um, right? War, you have to get, things to the, the front lines. So there was all sorts of developments in how to get food to the front lines and tinning and packaging and pa packaging and glassware. Um, and so, and, and the glass became cheaper. So there was all, so, sudden it was possible to make like individual glass jars. So, and, and the cardboard box, sorry. You're good, <laughs> the, man. These are like momentous things, like the fucking cardboard box. Like all of a sudden it became cheap to put things into a cardboard box. That was never the case in human history before. You, you Things would be carted around in like giant wooden crates or like, you know, these big, like the fruit that would arrive at the general store would be in big barrels that you'd have to like chisel out. And then all of a sudden you can put them into small cardboard boxes and like ship them pretty easily. Uh, it just made trade differently. But when you have an individual cardboard box, you have a glass bottle, you got to put a name on it, right? And so all of a sudden brand identity evolves in parallel to this packaging, right? You can't just, you don't just have like an anonymous box of cookies. You have Nabisco cookies, uh, you, you know? And, and, and so that brand identity comes and people at the general store were very happy. Everything at the general store happens behind the shelf. There's a grocer there who's like wearing an apron and he gets you all the stuff that you're, you give him a list and he fills out the list for you. And you're not touching any of the goods. Um, but as this packaging revolution starts happening, people get really suspicious of this model. They're, you know, is this guy a swindler? Is he gonna give me some subpar stuff? No, I want things in a package because that means no one has tampered with it. Uh, no one has, you know, it's maybe it's safer, even though of course it's not really any safer in the 1880s, there's no regulations around anything, but, but that's the mentality. It's like, oh, it's sealed up. It's gotta be safer, it's gotta be better. And, and it's got a brand on it. So people suddenly wanna start touching the their items they want to start choosing between it and so the notion of going to the store as a kind of creative act instead of like a place you go to get the same thing every time with your list you go there and it's this associative journey so the first real jump to the supermarket of today is this dude clarence saunders starts a, a chain called the piggly wiggly um in in tennessee and his big innovation was, I'm gonna let people touch the stuff. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'm gonna like, instead of a general store clerk behind the counter, he creates aisles that people are gonna walk up and down. It's actually a lot like a modern day Ikea where there's like one path that you wind through and you go down and you end up at a checkout. That was the first time anyone had done that and it blew people's minds. The Piggly Wiggly like goes crazy. And then after that, a guy named uh, Michael Cullen Dis, 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 kind of discovers, he innovates this idea that if I just make these stores bigger and I don't have to pay as much for warehousing space to get supplies in there, uh, I can, you know, staff fewer clerks because all they're doing is kind of bringing items out. Um, and because bigger spaces aren't going to be located on the main street anymore, I can locate them off, you know, kind of off strip and I get cheaper rent. And all of a sudden I can lower prices by just making a bigger store. 
Um, and that becomes the supermarket of today. And, and truly it was a mind blowing development for people because his prices were lower and there was more food there than people had ever seen. So it was better in both ways from the consumer perspective. When the first supermarket opens up in the US, people are driving 50 miles away to come and see it. There's like lines outside, like, a, like a, an attraction, like a museum. And when it opens up in the first supermarket opens up in Rome in 1954, which is pretty late, I guess, in my mind for thinking of this thing that like you assume has been around forever and ever. Uh, when the first one opens up in Rome in 1954, the Italians lose their minds and, and you know, they walk inside and start screaming like this, this month, like literally there's quotes of women in 1950s Rome screaming, this must be heaven and running up and down the aisles of that supermarket. That's so <laughs> it's nuts, man. 1954 seems so recent too. That's crazy that we take for granted these kind of things that like, even you earlier talking about the, like the fact that you're in there and this sounds so boring on paper, but honestly, people don't think about it. You're in there actively making decisions on what you buy instead of being like, I'm getting bread. Like you have right. all these different decisions of bread, all these different brands, these different packaging. You get to see it there. You get to make that choice without, I, I don't know. And that's, like I said, I'm talking about bread right now, which sounds super boring, but there's so much to that whenever you put it all there. And then on top of that, the logistics you were talking about earlier, because I mean, you've got all these different brands, all these different manufacturers, those manufacturers have different suppliers. It's truly like a web. Like you talked about the guys out in Thailand and, the, and like the, the fish market and everything like that's, that's one little part. I mean, that's less than 1% of a Walmart. You know what I mean? Like, so I, yeah, feel, yeah, yeah. I feel like it's, it's created a lot of different jobs for a lot of different, you know, it's created so much opportunity having supermarkets, but is it for the better? Or is it for the worse? Well, that's too big a question almost. It's for the better of the consumer. And often, as is the case in a, a, in a intensely capitalist uh, framework, it, it's often for the worse for the laborer. Uh, they're the same fucking person but most of the time. So your cost of goods, it, undeniably, the grocery store has, has lowered the cost of food and, and, and supply chains that have kind of grown up around them, um, you know. The, the stat I always cite, which is a little simplistic, is that you know, our great grandparents were paying 40% of their budget uh, for food. And our grandparents were paying about 20% of their budget for food. And we pay about 8%. Wow. So if you think about like something you currently pay 40% for, maybe that's, I mean, that's high for rent, even, you know, it's like that yeah. it suddenly disappears. And you have all this extra liquidity in your budget that you can spend on, you know, a house down payment. Like, that's pretty remarkable. At the same time, there is a very dark side to it. And, and that's why the book is called, you know, I call it the dark miracle of the American supermarket in the subtitle. Because a lot of those benefits do come from, uh, you know, nested races to the races to the bottom that often come out of employees uh and, and what we what we've the jobs that we create and expect from them have become steadily worse and worse as the industry has scaled up in volume um and so you see these two things happening at the same time and it's it's hard to balance in your head i mean it, to some extent it's it's asking for a judgment on capitalism itself um you know uh, and, and especially in the grocery world becomes very difficult to answer because so much of the costs are borne by people who are out of sight and out of mind. Um, you know, there's in the book details a number of domestic jobs like trucking that have been decimated by competition and race to the bottom kind of mentality deregulation. Um, but even they pale in comparison to the kind of things that you would see at the bottom of a supply chain uh, and that I found in Thailand where, where you actually see people who are trapped in, you know, something, no other word, but slavery, they're, they're in bondage, they're beaten if they don't work, they watch their fellow employees get killed, um, they're bought and sold and, and put on um, to the boats that they're working on. Um, and so th that, those costs to, to labor, we don't even notice. They're, they're lost in the, the volume of it. 
Is that um, is that due to like um, <clears throat> just the the sheer amount of like uh, grocery stores that are in the United States, or is that more typical for like just because maybe there are grocery stores in Thailand that is forcing that forced labor? Because it's interesting, the grocery store market's taking over the world, right? You said there's like thirty eight thousand, is it supermarkets? That's in America, yeah, thirty eight thousand supermarkets in America, probably two eighteen stat, right? No, it, it's the, Thailand's. Uh, seafood market is in, is is largely for export. In fact, the shrimp that you buy in Thailand is very unlikely to be tainted by the labor practices that I detail in the book because all of those are going for export overseas. Um, it's definitely funneling international appetites. Uh, it, it just, it's not a simple story because it, although obviously, I mean, it's, it sounds idiotic to even say it, but human bondage and traffic labor and slavery at the bottom of the supply chain is horrific and unacceptable. Uh, on the other hand, the forces that are creating that are complicated in the sense that there's a huge first world demand for those products, which creates those jobs, yes, but also those jobs represent, you know, a, the people who are get, largely getting pulled into those jobs are migrants who are looking for a better life. And they're trapped in situations that they, that, that are miserable to begin with. And you don't uproot your life for nothing. Uh, if you're a Burmese migrant or you're El Salvadorian, you do that because you're in a desperate situation. And so often it's these very, um, people who are really just trying to be agents of their own survival that are not victims at all, but kind of heroes in their, that are getting sucked into this um, and then exploited. Uh, so it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to cast around and start putting moral judgments on, I guess. Um, I, the answer is that it's, that it's really complicated. <laughs> well, it's, it sucks. It's something that people don't think about because they're honestly, and I don't ever think about it either, it's it's weird because we do think about like companies like Nike and H and M and all them doing like oh man they've got sweatshops and sweatshops are no good so I'm not going to support this company or whatever you don't think about that when you go to the grocery store because there's such a massive disconnect like yeah they don't like so like Walmart as a company uh you know they're getting their stuff from some other company or a, a plethora of companies I should say and they're like you know what we're going to go with these cheaper ones that are selling the same product but they're selling it for cheaper because that's a higher profit margin for us well then it goes another step because these companies are getting them from the suppliers from the the fishers in Thailand and stuff like this and they're going to go with the cheapest alternative which is the people who are literally indentured servants or slaves or whatever who are you know I bust busting their balls to get this stuff to us. And we don't see it. It's literally, it's so many degrees disconnected. We don't even think about it. We're just like, I'm going to go to this store because they got lower prices. That's right. And, and truthfully, we don't see it, but it's all done on our behalf. Like those Walmart, buy, like grocery is a very low margin business. It's a 1.5 to like 3.5% margin. So they're not right, like putting a huge, they're not making their money off like raising the, the difference between what they buy products for and what they sell it for. They make their money off of volume of how much they sell quantity. Yeah. Uh, and so those price comparison shopping, like the reason they're asking for a cheaper price is because they're scared shitless. The consumer is going to go somewhere else. And they're all looking over their own shoulder at the deals that someone else is giving offering because they know that if they don't have that every day, low price you're gonna sw swing over to aldi and if if you're you know and, and this exists on different tiers right whole foods is doing the same thing they're not competing with aldi necessarily but they're competing with other brands that are offering organic uh ethical or virtuous things so even on that tier there's still a lot of price comparison shopping by consumers and by the buyers on their behalf and by the you know the manufacturers that you as you said it just trickles down the train this the chain no matter how you do it and it turns out that for food necessarily we care a lot about standards in ways we might not care about it for like table legs or like other you know global commodity sourced goods because we want it to be safe and so there's a lot of fixed costs in food but the one thing that's rarely fixed especially when you globalize things 
is employment is, is labor fee labor uh i don't know what i'm saying like the, the, what you pay your employees yeah the that's, cost of that, labor that's something you can always look to to cut and so it's the place where these cuts get made um which of course creates these like absolutely horrific uh endpoints where the food supply system begins to depend on people's exploitation that's sad and i should say like that's the story with food for a long time i mean to some extent researching this book you do come you know, to the head to head with the, the idea that there may not have been a, a food supply in any sort of global or even international system that didn't depend on trafficked or, or exploited labor. Um, agriculture has a long, like very sordid history of exploitation. So it, its presence in, a, in the modern day should be less surprising than it is that the people have always kind of made their profit by exploiting people. So have you gotten any backlash from that, that type of language in your book about how you're, you're, you're exploiting that these people are getting taken advantage of? It's got to be common knowledge in the grocery arena that this is happening. Um, and I'm surprised that more people in America don't know it, you know, and, and I don't, like I said, there's that huge disconnect there. It's nothing I think about. Like, like I said, you hear about Nike, you hear about H and M, you hear about sweatshops, you hear about these different things. I don't ever like, that's never, even came to my mind for groceries. So I guess a two, yeah, a two parts. There's a huge disconnect and there's a huge um, a contentions gap. Nobody in the grocery world, and, and probably this is true for Nike and, and, and I just, I don't know, but nobody in the grocery world wants this to be the case. In fact, they're trying really hard to eradicate it. When, when I was looking into Thailand, um, they were, as you said, all very aware that this was a problem. Um, Internally, their quality control people knew about this problem before it broke. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, after the story broke, they double, triply wanted to solve it. Uh, but there is very little resources you have as a grocer in a commodity game to, to solve this problem. You're, we're talking about things that are like four levels deep on the supply chain. Um, that's just not your area of expertise if you're some dude sitting in Austin buying for Whole Foods to like reform somebody else's hiring practices four levels deep in a in a region that is you know ex you know in in an extremely difficult um, you know wealth divide so that there is a huge asymmetry between people who need jobs desperately and people who have jobs so that sets up the kind of ground for for exploitation right there like you're gonna somehow reform that supply chain by sitting in austin when you, your expertise is in like food logistics and shipping like nah, probably not like it's a nice dream uh, and we hold these stores accountable for that but there are limits to the extent that i think that that's a reasonable standard uh, so to ask, to answer your question, like, was there a lot of blowback? I, I haven't gotten much blowback. Maybe I should knock on wood uh, from the industry. I mean, most people in the industry who's read the book have been uh, have have been really nice and, and really appreciative of it, because I think I portray this in a pretty agnostic, but also um, like even handed. Like this exploitation exists because of culpability on multiple levels. Lo in largely including us as I was consumers. Gonna say, uh, yeah. like we're, we're part of it too yeah we're constantly shifting around and these guys in the grocery world that are trying to serve us uh just demonizing them doesn't do anything but, it doesn't, it's no good but so so whenever you say that though I, i'd be curious because whenever you walk into a grocery store isn't it their main objective it's like walking into a casino almost now to where it's just like they've they've delivered all of this in a certain way that it's just it 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 suggests you to spend all of your money there like you said, it, yeah. may, it may be 8% of your budget, but when you walk in there and you have five things on your list, you're going out with 20 things. Totally. You know what I'm saying? And it's because of their product placement and what they've done for, for advertising say, and selling. So I actually learned a little bit about that in like marketing and school and everything. And part of that has to do with, because you talked about there being a low uh, profit margin there. So you're going to squeeze out every penny anywhere you can kind of situation. And Honestly, the way our human brain works with psychology and advertising and all that, it's true that they put eye level 
all of your name brand stuff is usually right at eye level or like chest level or whatever, because those things are slightly more expensive. They're also usually on the end caps or near the middle. And then those like the, like if you were to split an aisle up into five, the ends have the more expensive stuff and right in the middle has the more expensive stuff. And then all the way down a strip in the middle has the more expensive stuff. And these weird like sections two and four don't because of the way our brains work for whatever advertising wise, we're more likely to get stuff in those areas. And that's what our eyes are drawn. But that's to. what I'm saying. They're feeding into it is what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. All of that stuff is quantified. I mean, even your description there is, is like in the general ballpark, but it's like so much more yeah. sophisticated now. And what's, I mean, what was interesting to me is it's not actually that they're even putting the most expensive items there. What they're putting there is the items that have paid the most to be there. It, all of that real estate is for sale. Um, every inch of the grocery store is for sale. It operates actually much more like a landlord than it does like a, like a, you know, uh, what am I thinking of? Like a, uh, like a farmer's market where like everyone has a stall and you just kind of show up. Um, each inch on the shelf, you know, they will either ask you for direct payment to get there or free product to get there or to sponsor like a buy one, get one thing that they can then, you know, if you're doing that, then they're getting 50% free product. Um, and it's incredibly sophisticated how they divide up the store. Um, and, and they make quite a bit of money on that now. In fact, some one analyst I talked to uh, estimated that they're making as much money from the sale of this like trade spend uh, as they are from selling the food in the low margin business. So like that's equal crazy. amount of grocery product. Yeah, profits come from that. So totally that's, that's just what confuses me is because we, we talk about the slave, slave labor in other countries and they're aware of it and it's something they're trying to stop. But yet when you go into the store, they're trying to do the most to maximize their profits and still continue that type of uh, behavior. Yeah. No, no, no. You're confused because you hit the nail right on the head. It's a paradox. That's what makes it's intention. Like the grocery store is exists to give us this incredible abundance. We started talking about in the beginning that continuously available thing. That's the miracle. That's what we're, that's, that's what they believe consumers want. And they're not, it's not without reason. That's an incredibly successful model. And you can imagine even yourself, if you went to a store and you were like, I'm going to get some shrimp and they don't have any shrimp that day, you might not go back to that store, right? You, you kind of mentally, uh, ex you, there's a lot of expectations that we have for what's going to be there. And if something's just not there at all, it doesn't compute with the grocery store model that we have in our heads. Uh, but as you said, that model of continuous abundance is in direct conflict with, um, you know, these dignified jobs or like stopping, stopping, including things that are attached to these exploitative, exploitive labor practices. Like you can't do both at the same time. <laughs> you, if you, if you were going to get serious about stocking only ethical things, you're going to need to have a powwow with your consumer and, and they explain that some things just aren't going to be available right now and then the, when the dude down the street opens up his store and 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 offers those same things and kind of explains that he's got some secret way of getting these without any ethical problems you're gonna you know you're in a tough spot as a as a grocery seller which is the i mean man that's we really are kind of at fault as the consumer a little bit and even though we don't think about it because I mean, the honest God truth is obviously if I was given two options and they're like, they put it like black and white and they show on, I can buy a case of water for here for two bucks, or I can buy a case of water here for five bucks. But this one shows the person who died in the process right. of making right. this, but they don't do that. And the thing is, no, if I'm course. just looking at price, I'm like, man, I'm going to go to this store more often because they've got it cheaper and it's the same product. I mean, I get like even the difference in our town of both, whether you're or not, you're going to high V or you're going to price chopper, you know, yeah. like and most, it's really brings up a whole different can of worms, which is those guarantees of what water includes the dude who's dying and which water is like virtuous and doesn't have any deaths associated yeah. is a for-profit industry of itself. It's the, it's the certification industry that's full of problems. So as consumers, we're both want to do the right thing, but we're also jaded. So you're like, Oh, well, is this ethically 
you know, superior version that I'm paying a dollar fifty for more actually going to be good, or is this just somebody like you know running a scam on me? And and, and as soon as that doubt gets in there, and it it has to be in there because that industry is full of a lot of scams. And then you just go uh, back to the cheap one and you're like, ah, yeah, screw it. then you let yourself off the hook almost instantaneously. Um, and also, even if it's not a pure scam, like there's just so many ways to put marketing language into things that will make those two different products seem equivalent from a consumption, from a consumer standpoint. <laughs> and then as soon as you make that purchase, they are basically interchangeable you forget about whatever happened on the other side well, it's, it's very interesting you bring up the certification point that's something that, I, that i've always been interested in um because you got you know organic people are really big on organic people are 100 percent organic and i was reading a little bit into what you were saying or at least within the podcast you were talking about like what does that whole process even mean um and when did it start when when did people start to wake up and say wh where's my money going and why and why am, you know what i'm saying yeah no it's a great question um, so organic has a huge history um, that is founded on the best ideals. Uh, and organic is a little different in that it's an actual USDA program that the USDA guarantees. Um, most other claims, so putting organic aside for just a second, um, most other claims are not guaranteed by the government. They're guaranteed by third party auditors who come in and you know, verify to whatever extent. That's basically can. just marketing at that point. Well, it's, it's worse than marketing <laughs> because it's actually a huge amount of labor that's involved. I mean, this is a $50 billion industry uh, per year that involves a lot of inspectors with clipboards who go running into manufacturing plants and, and they look at it and they go up and down. And, and there's a lot of energy that's expended trying to please these things. If you're a manufacturer, you have to pay for that. It's for profit, of course, so you can sometimes shop around and maybe get the auditor that you want, or you can pay that auditor for a special class where they'll teach you all the things they're going to audit you on, and then you can pass that audit with flying colors. Um, but it, it, but it's certainly uh, it's worse than marketing in some ways because it's it's a tremendous time and energy suck on, on people who are running these things. And the truth is that an audit, so an audit is just a snapshot look at a place. Um, it, it makes some sense for financial world where everything is documented and there's audit books that you can look through and you can trace these abstract ideas through and, and kind of follow the money to its sources and see if it all adds up. It makes a little less sense, but still some sense for empirical things like food disease and like pathogens where you can measure the pathogen count in something and see, oh, this area, if I go in here today has bacteria, like this, this is something I can measure and I can, it makes much less sense for things like we're talking about in terms of ethical claims like wage abuse. You're not going to walk into a company and find wage abuse from six months earlier, probably if you're not even allowed to talk to the employees or they speak a language that you don't speak. It, it's like that stuff disappears real quickly or is really easy to hide. Um, and so you have companies that have false books or, or um, you know, software that allows them to create different um, payment systems, one for the, for the auditor who comes in and one for their employees. Or you just have employees who, who are getting pay stubs and, and the auditor never have, actually looks at them because they're, they're not around on the day of the audit or that pay stub is in the past and th their current pay stub is fine. Um, but the one six months ago was, was wrong. And, and these audits are never surprised. They're always planned in advance. So gaming this stuff is the easiest thing. In, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's definitely, if, if you have a multi-million dollar business, you better believe you can figure it out. I was going to say, in my experience, the audits seem kind of, you've, we both work in a field where there's an audit yeah. that happens that it's, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it's like, you're talking one or two days out of the right. year. You can make a change on that day to make sure you're going to pass the audit. Right. You know what I mean? It's not how the business is running all the time. No, a hundred percent, especially not for audits that are set up in advance. And yeah. again, I don't know what industry y'all are in. I'm curious, but like these, the fish, the biggest fish processor in Thailand, Thai union 
has 45,000 people working in its manufacturing plant. That's a small city, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an auditor walking in there on a two day visit, it's just a joke. It's like you're trying to audit a small town. Um, it's, it's not, it's not real. Uh, and of course the industry is responding and, and, and they're, they're trying to adjust and, and do, you know, new things to kind of combat this, but, but where it is right now, it's, it's, it's certainly lacking. For sure. No, yeah, we're in the uh, restaurant industry. We've both been there yeah, for no, a really yeah. long time. So, I mean, we've, we've seen some stuff for sure. We've both oh, managed. Yeah. We've both, yeah, nothing special, but it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I was just a little more curious. Audits are not an accurate representation of day-to-day -day business. I, I was right. just, I was just a little more curious about like whenever you go into the store and then you see like it says this is a hundred percent grass fed beef or this is a hundred percent organic, but then you see those documentaries and they say the actual process to do that it's just literally the same meat but with a different package on it. Is there any truth to that? Uh, there is some truth to that. You know, it's, again, this is a problem with talking about an industry where the volume is so huge. They, like there, there is, of course, there's truth to that. There's food fraud that's going on constantly. <laughs> there is also plenty of good actors who aren't doing that. And what's troubling is like the audit system isn't good at differentiating those two things. It, it isn't good at, um, you know, labeling only one or the other. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, look, one of the parts of the book, I go into this I, I found this food safety scientist who told me a story about a turkey house where they had a little door in the back. It was a caged, uh, not caged actually, it's just a shed, shed full of turkeys. She jammed in there and there's a little door in the back and the turkeys can go outside if they want to, uh, but none of them do. And then they sell as many of those turkeys as they can as free range, you know, uh, turkeys and then the rest they just sell as commodity turkeys and you know what what do you make of that it's like a, it's ridiculous like the there's no difference between what they're selling the 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 life of the turkey is not materially affected if you're trying to do this because you have some vision of some paradise farm with really happy turkeys that's not what you're supporting um how common is that and like where does that land is that that's like outside of my expertise I couldn't begin to tell you grocery stores might have some inkling because they do have people in quality assurance who are kind of studying this stuff but it's not really in anyone's best interest to start poking around there and so what you get is anecdotes on both sides you get anecdotes of like these really terrible things that people have seen are they representative I don't know so, well, sorry, Johnny. So what we've created, it, it's already here and it's in place and it's in motion and we're all a part of it. You know, we've, we've created yeah. this big monster for better or for worse. A lot, you know, it's all we know. It's all I know. It's all you know. Um, what is probably the most important thing in your book or, or something? What's, is there anything that we could do to change the current system? Something that would be simple and we could all do together to make it better? Yeah, there's something that we can all do together. It's not simple. I mean, I guess one thing that the book really points the way towards is unpleasant sounding because it doesn't feel like very empowering. But this notion that we can vote with our dollars and just buy the best stuff and that's going to create a better world is really seductive, but it's probably not going to change things for the better in a big picture way. If you're trying to root out Thai slavery, uh, you need police you need, you know, if someone's enslaved because they've been kidnapped, you need people who know how to deal with kidnapping and rescuing kidnapped people. You don't need a grocery buyer or you don't need an auditor to, they shouldn't be doing that work. That's a miss. So, so I guess the thing that we can all do together is kind of shift our focus to these policy level things. Like if we're going to make trade treaties with places well they need to have enforcement teeth they, they you can't just globalize jobs and not globalize standards and you gotta fund those standards so that uh that things that require police action get police action uh and and similarly domestically i think things that support workers rights uh, and 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 workers being able to self-advocate whether that's wage floors whether that's unions, it can look a lot of different ways and it, it can be politically devices, but things that allow workers to actually advocate for themselves, like th that's gonna be a solution to, to this because 
to the, the problems I'm, I'm talking about because um, that places the responsibility in the right place workers self-advocating for themselves. And it, if we give them the right foundation for it, um, they'll prevent the kind of race to the bottom. Um, but right now the, we've like eroded unions in this country for the last, you know, God knows how many years, 40, 50 years. Um, workers' rights right now are, are in a pretty dismal place. So they're really susceptible to, to, to kind of race to the bottom um, things. So that's not great answers, not what you want to hear because they're not personally empowering, like we can all go out and do this. But that's where I came to is like, stop thinking about what I can do when I'm using my credit card to solve this problem and start thinking like what I can do in the voting booth, what I can do by supporting the right policies. How can I ad advocate on that level um, to get things changed? I actually really like that answer. Cause I feel like most people do have that sense of like, oh man, we can change this if we just work together on this. And I'm like, some things aren't at that level where there's so much more to it. You brought up police and everything. Like it's not on the grocer. It's not on the consumer other than the spending with your dollar part. But other than that, like there's some things, it sounds so dismal, but there's some things that you on your own, other than bringing awareness to it and voting and stuff, aren't going to be able to like change. Yeah. Like you have no direct effect on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I certainly think this is one of those things that falls into that category. I do think, look, I, I think farm markets are great. I think that the, if you can buy directly from a producer that you trust, so you have a relationship with that farmer, look, you've, sent, you've circumvented the entire audit system right there. Cause it doesn't, you don't, if you know and trust that person, you don't need to have some dude with a clipboard walking around uh, poking his nose in business to, to get that sense of trust. So th those are viable things that you can look for and do. They just don't scale up quite as easily. Like I buy all my pecans from this pecan farmer who I just made acquaintance with uh, very randomly. I can't do that for all of my goods. Like the grocery store brings tremendous convenience. It's a miracle for a reason. And like to try to replicate that and make myself the grocery store buyer, I don't think that's a, a real solution either. Um, but having, it is something positive that you can do for sure. Having a cookout, I need to go find my local marshmallow farmer <laughs> so I can make some s'mores. Exactly. How sustainable is the current system that we're in right now? I mean, with the mass production, and I, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but like how sustainable is this type of environment for, let's say the next hundred to 200 years? Like, cause it, oh, it re uh, requires a lot of, of production, a lot of food and meat. And, you know, I just, I'm just curious. Totally. Well, there's just sustainability means a whole rack of different things. Um, I mean, on one level, so this guy, Tom Philpot, who writes for Mother Jones, just came out with a book, Perilous Bounty, which is excellent. Um, and he details the way that agriculture in, in, the, in California is draining the water tables out there and agriculture in Iowa, which of course is like our soy basket and, and a lot of our grains come, come from there. Uh, is depleting our soil. And so those practices are certainly not um, sustainable on a very physical level. Uh, and, and, you know, that book seems to point to a, a agricultural reckoning that will have to happen. I mean, if you, if California, where, which produces, you know, some ungodly percent of, of all of our uh, edibles, domestic edibles, fruits and nuts and, uh, runs out of water in a, in, a, in a real way, that's a sustainability crisis on a, on a, on a big level. Um, but then there's other, you know, that what I'm talking about with labor is like this the quiet um, unsustainability. I, I don't think that it's, um, I'm actually more optimistic there in that I, I don't think it's sustainable over the long term because I, but, but I hope that we can change it because uh, in a gradual manner, because if not, I think the change will be pretty ugly in terms of just like the, you know, I think ultimately it's a, the arc of justice does bend towards like, or the arc of human progress does bend towards justice and does bend towards human dignity. But like the act of bending that could be violent and unpleasant if, you know, people aren't, um, if their needs aren't met, they're going to figure out a way to meet them. So I, I, the sustainability question is tough on a lot of those. For sure. Of those. I know it's, 
real quick with the, and I know we got to get ready to wrap it up because yeah. you got to go. Uh, the sustainability thing, and this is way out there, but honestly, you, we talk about how supermarkets and whatnot came to be, and you said like 1954 or whatever was the first one in Rome. That's so young and so new. You talk right. about the sustainability of 200 years. Bro, 60 years from now, supermarkets may not be the same thing that we are. Like, maybe everything's online at that point. Maybe Amazon is like a grocery store. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you talk about sustainability. Right. We might adapt and overcome and just move on to something completely different by then. Yes. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's some really exciting things happening in hydroponic spaces. There's a big battle over that and whether it should get the organic label. And I don't know, you know, everything takes inputs. And so the energy that goes into the, some of these hydroponic farms, I, I, I'm not qualified, but I do know that there are people who are really excited about them and, and the amount of space and, and water and energy they take up. And, and, and yeah, our food system will hopefully has the capacity to evolve. <laughs> and if it does, hopefully that will be in the direction of, of creating, you know, kind of more dignity for the people who are working in it. Definitely. And it's, it's hours flown by. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it went, it went quick, but There's that's a good. So, I, yeah, just so means many, I enjoyed it. I like talking about so it. many other questions, man. But if I could leave you with, I, I don't know if you have one more question, but I have one more question. I'm just curious, man. What's like the biggest conspiracy within the grocery arena that maybe you've heard of or even seen, or you know what I'm saying? Like what's like the biggest conspiracy that you've heard of in the grocery industry? And is there any validation to it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that idea of like sh shelving inches for sale it, like so if when i followed this entrepreneur around trying to get her product it was it's called slasa it's a combination coleslaw salsa uh very delicious uh onto shelf she was she was someone who'd building this up from like commercial kitchen to the store she would talk about her competition and the competition wasn't necessarily like other relishes or ketchup or mustard or coleslaw it was the store itself the store was was her biggest rival in that they would come and ask for money at every time she grew her business, they would want a piece of it, whether that was through buying or selling the inches of shelf space or through advertising fees that they would tack on. Um, and so I, I don't know where that lands on a conspiracy level, but like, that's real, that's a real part of being an entrepreneur in the grocery space is that you are competing against the store itself because they've reinvented their business model into a place where you now have to pay to play in that store. Uh, you have to pay to get on the shelf. And not only that, they'll, they'll try and make your product too and like make it in house and then sell it themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And they do it at the same co-packer. So you, that's like in a co-packing facility, they'll go to the same person who's making your product Jesus. and get them to do it for five cents cheaper. And then you're really screwed um, <laughs> because it's probably just that's about crazy. as good. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So that that's all real. I, that's not in the conspiracy realm. Right. Anyway, y'all, this was super fun. Uh, sorry to ramble so much, but uh, it was no, a real pleasure. No, no, definitely, man. So just, uh, we got your book right here in the middle of our podcast. Is there anywhere, I mean, where can we find you? I know you have a website, you have a YouTube channel or anything like that, or any plugs you want to throw out no, there? I'm not a good, I'm not a good at the YouTube channel stuff. I, I, uh, I'm on the web. You Google me, uh, Amazon, you know, books in Amazon. It's in bookstores everywhere. Um, you know, like I do lots of podcasts, so I have a pretty decent media presence. We'll, we'll have point. a, we'll have a link down below in the description to get to your book and all that kind of stuff. So that's, yeah. So it's out there, but no, I, I don't have enough to say to, to, to have a YouTube channel. It's, gotcha. It's, that sounds scary. I don't know, man. <laughs> to me, like I said, it's our one by quick. I think you have, you have a lot to say and a lot of important information because a lot of our time is spent in grocery stores, man. I can tell you that at least for families and people who oh, have yeah. kids like, man, it's a, like you said, it's like a chore to go there and just, you know, there's so many more un unanswered questions that I have for you, but hopefully maybe sometime we can have you on again and get those questions answered. I got, I Absolutely. know you got to go. I got one super quick one. What's your next book going to be about? What do you want? What do you uh, want to write about next? That's super quick, but super hard to answer. Fair enough. Um, uh, I wish I could give you a, a straightforward answer, but I'll, anything I say, it would just sound like madness. Um, probably about green energy. Okay. But, that's, that's good. I, I that's... haven't even settled exactly on that topic but gotcha. We'll cool. See. Well, rock on. All right, guys, Benjamin, Super thanks for pleasure. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, absolutely. It was really fun. Cool. Well, have a good night, sir. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Have a good night.
Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Ben, oh, okay. Yeah, cool. ben, Benjamin Lore joining us. Uh, great podcast, man. This nice, fast, and, and quick. Yeah. So, still a lot of information, man. So, it's crazy. I don't know if you have any lasting thoughts about that. But Not really, other than the fact that, man, it's it's so, even from the beginning, it's so weird because groceries, do, man, none of it sounds interesting, but it all actually is. Like, if you yeah. look deeper into it, like, there's probably, there's someone out there watching this or listening to this, and they're like, man, I don't know about that, because you're just talking about groceries the whole time. But, man, if you really delve into it and, like, read into his book and, like, man, like I said, I watched some of the, another video that he was on or read some of, like, a review about his book where they went into details about certain chapters and stuff. And I'm like, man, it gets really deep into, like, the nitty-gritty, like. Right. And then, yeah, exactly. It's just those things, like you said, we take for granted. We don't really even think about these types of things when we go grocery shopping. And I think it's just something people should be aware about or be aware of. It's like, hey, man, like, all this doesn't come free. You know, it all yeah. comes at a cost, and it's just... And, and, it doesn't and, mean you can stop it either, though. No, no. It's like, mean, you're not going to stop going to Price Chopper and no, buying groceries. I'm just, now you're aware of it, though. At right. least, like, you know that... But I don't know what that does. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't know what being aware of it does. I just, I mean, if there's a collective awareness about a certain subject, I think it could be ultimately a good no, thing. No, I think knowledge is always a good thing. For sure. Like, like even if you're not directly stopping it, even if... You, but just going in there and knowing that and spreading that knowledge to other people is a good thing because learning about anything is a good thing, in my opinion. Right. I mean, like I said, especially something that is important is what we're putting into our bodies. Yeah. But uh, hopefully maybe one day we can have him back on. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? But um, uh, if you guys like this podcast, the best thing you can do is share and like this, uh, share and like this podcast. Um, if you're on iTunes or Spotify, just give us a five-star rating. Leave a comment on there because, man, we fucking rock it out. Um, and that's really all you can do. Comment below. Let us know what you think. Uh, still waiting for people to comment. We're two subscribers away from 600, so that's some pretty interesting stuff. Next week, oh, nice. we have a, a, uh, an extraterrestrial psychic coming on the show. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested for that one because I don't know what that means. Yeah, I know. I legitimately, I don't know what that means. But uh, she's an author as well. It's going to be a great podcast. I appreciate all of our junkies out there staying tuned and, and checking in each and every single week. I appreciate each guest that comes on the show as well. Um, to all our junkies out there, stay fly. Ring that bell.